welcome, on behalf of the Latino <laughs> Business Association, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to our 10th Annual Leadership Conference. To celebrate 10 years of achievement for the Latino Business Association, we focus on what made this organization great, a decade of learning, progress, and change. Learning is the core of our daily lives, not just academically, but through life experiences and change. In our childhood, we learn behaviors that shape our sense of identity. Socially, we learn how to interact and make friends. We develop a sense of self through the guidance of our parents and teachers and what they have experienced. Higher education is the core of what gets us ready for the real world. We learn and engage in critical thinking and learn to analyze beyond the simplicity of what we see. Finally, we arrive at the finish line, and our own experiences become the lessons for future generations, just like all the professionals we see here today. Today's generation of young people right now is the largest the world has ever known. One in every three people alive today is under the age of 30. The challenge of creating enough jobs and opportunities for our global youth population entering the labor market is one of the largest that our world faces. And success is something all college students are looking to achieve. It doesn't mean earning a lot of money or gaining a lot of fame. It may mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Sometimes learning from the experiences of people in our community, our neighbors, neighborhoods, and our city is better than buying a expensive books, uh, book at the bookstore. Our generation now and in the future will play a big role in how the world develops and, ch and changes in the years to come. We are the first generation that could either eradicate extreme poverty and also the last generation to prevent a catastrophic climate change. Today in attendance, we have a group of young, vibrant students and it brings hope for future generations and our community. In them, I see the progress and change that will shape the future for our children, our grandchildren, our education system, our government, and how the world sees us. Just think, if we can accomplish so much in just 10 years, imagine what we can do in the next 20, 30, or 40 years to come. In the words of the inspirational Jaime Escalante, ganas is all you need. So to start, we are very grateful to those who helped put this event together. This year, we, have the for the fortune we are very fortunate to have the support of great sponsors, including SCORE, the UCSB Multicultural Center, the Residential Housing Association, and the students, the Student Initiated Recruitment and Retention Committee. We want to thank you for making help, for helping make today possible. In addition, we want to thank every professional who took the time out of their busy schedule to be here with us today. And finally, thank you to our members and our students who took the time out of midterm season to also come and be here with us today to support, learn, and develop themselves. We hope that you all can take something from today. The agenda for today's conference covers workshops which will include topics like learning how to build your network, presented by professional event planner, blogger, business coach, and score mentor, Zoe Felici. Networking in digital space, presented by business coach and score mentor, Elisa Wilcox. Making financial progress, presented by score mentor, Greg Roosevelt. Change in the Workforce, presented by Acting Assistant Dean of Students and Director, Joaquin Becerra. And finally, we are extremely fortunate and excited to conclude our conference with a motivational message by our keynote speaker, the Vice President of Latin Affairs of Coca-Cola, Peter Villegas. Today is a day of growth, knowledge, and inspiration. We hope that at the end of today, you are inspired as a student by our professionals, and as a professional by the future leaders of our community. Thank you. So if you could just help me welcome uh, the VP and Head of Latin Affairs for Coca-Cola, Peter Villegas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There's probably a place to be right here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I know I'm the last person before you end your day, so I will uh, try to be as uh, thorough as possible and uh, helpful as possible. First and foremost, let me thank uh, the leadership of the Latino Business Association, uh, Melissa, Maria, George, and Linda. Thank you guys for putting this whole conference together. We need a round of applause. <laughs> So uh, the 
individuals from SCORE who take time out of their day to serve as mentors, to help, to be there for you. I can't tell you how important that is for individuals to do this on a volunteer basis. So please give uh, Zoe, Alyssa, Jim, Tom, uh, Greg, and my very good friend Miguel Avila for our spending time with you. So I'm on the clock. I hope uh, to get into some Q&A. I think the best thing that I always enjoy when I speak to students at schools is the Q&A. I want to hear what you're interested in. I want to be able to try to answer some questions that could be helpful as you navigate your career. But before I do, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the youngest of seven boys, uh, born in Victorville, California. Anybody from Victorville, the high desert? No one? <laughs> Where are y'all from? You from all of Southern California? You from Northern California? Anybody from out of state? So this is all, all California. Nice, West Coast. Good. Um, my dad was from Sonora, Mexico. He, uh, he's passed, but he was uh, born in 1922 and uh, came to Arizona when he was five years old and only finished with a fifth grade education. Uh, he met my mom in Coachella. Someone's from Palm Springs. Who's from Palm Springs? Oh, where are you from? You're from Palm Springs and you're from? Cathedral City. So they met in Indio, California uh, back in the 40s and they moved up to Victorville where there was a cement plant that was opening in, uh, in Victorville. My dad became a driller for 30 years. So with a fifth grade education, seven boys, his job was to take a giant driller, go on top of a mountain, drill holes into the mountain, load dynamite, drop dynamite, blow up the mountain for cement. That's what he did for 30 years and he raised seven boys. Uh, I'm the youngest. I have an older brother who uh, passed away. He was a truck driver. I have two brothers that are construction workers. I have a brother who's an athletic director at Las Madonnas College in uh, Antioch. Anybody from the Antioch area? Oh, are you from Antioch or where are you from? Concord. Yeah. Okay, both of you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I have a brother who's uh, retired. He went back to school to get a degree at Laverne University in Claremont. Anybody from that area? Ontario. Ontario. We live in Rancho Cucamonga. Yeah, IE, represent. Uh, and then uh, my uh, other brother, uh, Danny, who is, who is an attorney. He went to the University of Redlands. And when he graduated from the University of Redlands, he went up to Lewis and Clark College in Portland, where he became, he got his law degree. And so I did not go to school. Uh, I worked my way up um, in a very unique way, one that I don't encourage you to follow <laughs> because it's tough. That's why I really admire what you're doing. Uh, although I did not go to school, I'm a big advocate for education, especially higher education, uh, because it's the best thing you can do to prepare yourself for the future. But I will tell you, in my background, my dealings with folks who do have an education, that do have degrees, and how I've been able to navigate my career for over 23 years, going on 24 years, in corporate America, 20 of which were in banking. So I began my career as a teller, um, counting money, 20 years ago. And the lady who trained me, her name was Tita Woods, down in Southern California, in uh, anybody from Orange County? Where are you from? Found Valley. Found Valley, okay, I was in Stanton, Stanton, California, at San Juan Bay. And Tita Woods trained me to be a teller. Tita is Tiger Woods' mom. And Tiger Woods in eighth grade, you guys know who Tiger Woods is? Yeah. Tiger Woods was in eighth grade when I was uh, working as a teller with his mom. She would always come in and bring in articles about my eighth grade, Golf Sun and <laughs> magazines and newspapers and uh, it taught me a very good lesson. It says that to remind myself to always be nice to eighth graders because you don't know <laughs> what they're going to do, who they're going to become. So pay attention to eighth graders. Um, 
So let me just uh, jump to what I'm doing today. So I'm, I'm very sports oriented. I'm a sports guy. My whole life is based on sports. I grew up with my brothers playing sports, very athletic. Everything I do, I connect with sports. And I finished 20 years at J.P. Morgan through a series of acquisitions and mergers. And I was asked if I would consider coming over to Coca-Cola. And so it points to your theme, learning, progress, and change. And Maria wanted me to talk about networking. So I'm going to focus on networking real quick. Um, I was cool. I was set at J.P. Morgan. I didn't have any reason to leave. I was very happy. Uh, but uh, an individual who I've known for 15 years through networking, Rudy Pesetta, who was the head of the Office of Black Affairs at Coca-Cola, asked me if I would consider coming over to Coca-Cola. And I said, you know what? I'm at a point in my career. I'm still relatively young. Uh, I just turned 50. Uh, so that's young, even though you guys may not think that, that's, that's young. Uh, and I said, do I want to finish my career in banking? I've already, I've already done 20 years, but I want to go another 20 years. Or do I want to challenge myself? Do I want to take a chance? And as the proverb goes, the Chinese proverb, a, a turtle doesn't move unless it sticks its neck out. I was very comfortable, I was very safe in my role at J.P. Morgan, but do I want to take a chance and go to Coca-Cola, the most recognized brand in the world? Uh, if you're gonna look at any corporation, I'm sure you guys who study marketing, study Coca-Cola. There's no other brand like it. It's the only two countries where we are, we are, we are not in is Iran and Cuba. That's it. Everywhere else you can get Coca-Cola, you see the logo, you see the sign. And so I said, do I want to take a chance and uh, move myself? Because I'm at an age now where it wasn't just about me, like it is for you individuals. You guys are going to be in an opportunity to take some tremendous risks as you start your career. Me, uh, I have family. I'd like to introduce them. My beautiful wife, Vicki. And my beautiful daughter, Ali, who I brought with us. Thank you. Please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Vicky and I have been married 22 years. Uh, I'm married up. So, fellas, the key to success is to marry up. We've got to get that. And then uh, my daughter is 15. She's in 10th grade. She's got a 3.9. Pretty good. And I wanted her to come with me today because I want her to see what you guys are doing. You guys, always remember this, you guys are examples for somebody. Uh, you are role models for somebody. Uh, you may not know that, but someone is always watching. You could be your, your little brother, your little sister, your niece, your niece's little brother, your friend's little brother. Uh, you guys are role models, and so that's why I wanted to bring my daughter as well. And so I decided to take a risk and move over to Coca-Cola. Now, I was offered many opportunities before Coca-Cola, but it was always in the banking industry. Uh, I did not want to move from one bank to another bank in the same industry. Um, didn't seem smart to me. But I said, do I want to go from one industry to another industry um, where I think I can make an impact? The only way I was able to do that is through my network. I've known Rudy for 15 years through various external boards and organizations, so he saw me operate on these board meetings and these board discussions and in my external role. What you guys are doing right now is the key to your success. You don't have to be here. Is this, is being a part of the LBA mandatory? Is it voluntary? That is a great example of being, uh, taking initiative on your own career. That is going to be so valuable to you down the line, so I want to applaud you. If I were, how old are you guys, 20, 19? I'd probably still be asleep if I was 19 years old. <laughs> yeah, I'd still be asleep. 
So let me applaud you guys for what you're doing. So it was the networking opportunity that allowed me to even be considered and showcase my skills. Remember I told you that you're always being watched? You're always being watched. I'm always being watched. And Rudy saw something in me that he thought would be beneficial for his company, something that I bring to the table. So I asked him, I said, uh, he goes, Peter, would you consider coming over to Coca-Cola? I said, sure, you know, I'm open to it. Uh, what would I do? He said, you would do exactly what you're doing now just for us. I said, who, do we, who would I report to? He said, you would report to the president of North America. So Coca-Cola is global. I'm in Coca-Cola North America. So that's Canada, Mexico, and the United States of America. That's my responsibility. And the fact that I report to the president means that I have direct access to the decision makers. So I took a chance and I said yes. It was the best move I have made in my professional career. It was a risk, uh, but it is, and it was a challenge, but it allowed me to, to, to re-energize myself and re-establish myself. And I think if there's a couple things I'll leave with you, that you continue to put challenges in front of you. Get out of your comfort zone. If you get settled, figure out a way to make yourself uncomfortable so that you can continue to challenge yourself. My role right now is as head of Black Affairs is I have responsibility for anything Latino. Anything that Coca-Cola does across North America, I have to make sure that it touches the Hispanic Latino community. And that I explain to my company the difference between Orange County, California, Orange County, Texas, and Orange County, Florida, as an example, all different. Orange County, Florida is all Cuban. Puerto Rican, uh, Dominican, Orange County, California, majority, many common. But the uniqueness within those uh, cultures is something that we have to understand as, uh, as a brand and as a product. And it's my responsibility to know that information, to have the intelligence, and then to, to tell folk these are the things that we need to do and how we need to change it if we're going to try to hit some key uh, targets in Florida and key targets in, in California. Right now, and I work very hard at the bank, I work very hard to get out of the Latino segment. I wanted to show that I can have responsibilities for African American, Asian, gay and lesbian, mainstream, anybody. I worked very hard when I was at the bank. And I did very well. Probably the best thing that I did was to be able to develop these relationships. Another key, get out of just the Latino connection. Build relationships with people in other communities and other backgrounds. But when they asked me to come to Coca-Cola, I said, uh, to head Latin Affairs, which would be specifically for the Hispanic community, I said, look, California, Texas, and Florida are majority Latino populated states. By the year 2020, 14 other states will become majority minority states fueled by the Latino population. Nevada, New Mexico, Illinois, uh, Colorado. So from a business perspective, not from a social perspective, from a business perspective, in order for Coca-Cola to succeed and get that product out and the other products that we sell, we have to to engage and connect with the Hispanic consumer. And it's not enough just to sell to the Hispanic consumer. We have to understand the issues that are impacting the Hispanic community, like DACA, like the immigration challenges that we're facing right now. Uh, and so we, I did it, best thing I ever did, and those are my responsibilities. Right now, I report directly to the president of the company for North America, and I serve on our operation, uh, operating committee or executive leadership team. One of 13 people that developed the strategy for Coca-Cola. It's a very important uh, round table to be a part of. I'm the only Latino on that body. It's uh, our headquarters are in Atlanta. 
So I have, I travel quite a bit, but I have to be there in order to be at the table. The table that we need more of you to be at. The one thing that I would I applaud you with, and Maria asked me to, to say a couple things about what would I change or what would I wish happened faster. First of all, I wouldn't change a thing about my journey. People always ask, you wish you would have went to school now that you've achieved what you've achieved. Do you go back and do you wish I went to school? No, I do not. Because I think if I would have went to school, I wouldn't have met my wife. Vicky. That is the number one thing that anybody can do is have a partner that supports you, that uh, understands what you're trying to achieve. I know a lot of successful people with college degrees and a lot of money, but they're very lonely. They don't have a partner. So as you go through your own journey, ladies, if you don't have a guy supporting your efforts to be successful, to be empowered, to be independent, leave them. Don't waste your time with somebody that's not supporting you trying to achieve your goals. Fellas, support the ladies. And if you don't have a lady supporting you, trying to achieve your goals, leave them. It's a two-way street. If you, you uh, hopefully you find somebody in your life that's going to be a partner with you, just make sure that you support their goals and that they support your goals. Otherwise, you're going to be spinning your wheels. It's going to be very frustrating. And that's another smart decision I made. Again, fellas, marry up. You gotta marry up so they can support you. Um, so that's where I'm at at Coca Cola. Uh, networking, critical. I can't, I can't explain to you how important your network is. Right now, you developing your network, your contacts. This is your property. No one can take that away from you. When I develop my network, my contacts. That's mine. That's why they want to be at Coca-Cola, because of what I knew and who I know. Let, let, me, let, me, let me change that. You know that saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know? That's not true. <laughs> it's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. It's who knows you. Are they going to answer the call when you need them? If you work for Verizon Telecommunications, and there's a bill that you gotta get passed, and you need to call Congressman Avila. I may know Congressman Avila, but he doesn't know me. So when I make the call, he's gonna go, I don't know this guy, I'm not gonna take his call. But if he knows me, I'm gonna say, Congressman Avila, he goes, hey Peter, how are you? Hey Congressman, I have this challenge with the bill, can you help me out? That's what I do. It's not who I know, it's who knows me, that's what I work established and that's why I was brought to Coca-Cola. I'll give you a great example of nurturing and managing your network. You guys are all from California, so you better know these, these people who I'm referring to. Who is the Secretary of the State of California? Miguel, you're not a student. You're not 20. Come on, people! If, if, if you are going to be leaders in this state, if you're going to man, if you're going to get in business, you have to know. Let me go back. Let me go even back further. Who are the two U.S. senators for California? Good. Who's the secretary of the state of uh, that table right there? Those five. Who's the secretary of the state of California? Who's oh, this table? You got, I'm going to talk to you guys later. <laughs> Who's the Secretary of State of California? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Are you stupid? No. Who's the Secretary of State? And don't Google it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay, you gave me the Senate. Okay, that one. Who's the Secretary of State of California? Okay, LBA, you got work to do. Who is it? Okay, who's from the San Fernando Valley? 
Who's from Bequina? <laughs> Alex Padilla is the Secretary of State of California. The first Latino to be elected statewide, ever, in that office. He is responsible for the elections, for the ethics, for the state of California. He was the youngest Los Angeles City Council president in LA history at the age of 28. He went to MIT. When I met Alex, he was a district director for a uh, other city council. So he was a staffer. I've known him 23 years. And in that relationship, he went from a staffer to LA City Council member, to LA City Council president, to a California state senator, now to the California Secretary of State. That is a relationship that I've nurtured for 23 years. If things go the way he would like them to go, and I would like them to go, when Senator Dianne Feinstein retires, Alex Padilla can be a U.S. Senator. Latino U.S. Senator for California. That is an example of, of planting the seed of a relationship in Washington grow. You guys better work on some, some of these representatives. I'm gonna ask another one, right, who's in the back? <laughs> I'm gonna to go to this table again, all right. Who's the Attorney General for California? Uh, who, Miguel! <laughs> who's the Attorney General for California? These are Latinos running the state of California. There's not a, oh. You know who Jamie Diamond is? CEO. Jamie Diamond is the CEO of J.P. Morgan, probably the most influential banker in the world. When Jamie Diamond speaks, whatever he says could have an impact on the stock market, good or bad. I work with Jamie Diamond. Uh, probably the best example and, and the best experience I ever had of working with a top-notch leader. Jamie Diamond in banking is like uh, Kobe Bryant in basketball. Uh, the best. And he said, government relations, public policy is a line of business. So whether you're gonna work for corporate America or whether you're gonna start your own business and be an entrepreneur, you have to understand public policy and the impact it'll have on your business. To go deeper, you're going to have to understand the policy makers, the representatives that are going to make those decisions on your business, on your life, on your livelihood. That is what I do. So, Congressman, uh, Attorney General Javier Becerra is the first Latino Attorney General in the state of California. Before, he was a congressional member. When Kamala Harris went to U.S. Senator, Governor Brown appointed Congressman Javier Becerra to that position. This will be his first time he's gonna run statewide and win by election, he'll win. But these are two very important people that you must know and must follow and must support if they align with your beliefs. Javier is fighting the Trump administration on immigration, on DACA, on other issues impacting Californians. What I'm most proud of these guys, my friends, is that they're not representing Latinos, they're representing Californians. So those are two good examples. I'll give you more, but I don't want to keep asking questions. <laughs> so, Linda, George, Maria, Lisa, look, you guys gotta do a public policy focus group. You guys gotta get caught up on who these policy makers, especially in California. Uh, because I guarantee you, one of the best things that I do for Coca-Cola is I travel across the country. I go to New York, I go to Florida, I go to Chicago, you name it, I've been there. Except Idaho. No offense to Idaho. I actually said that one time, and the person I said it to says, I'm from Idaho. Uh, every other state looks to California for leadership. Everybody in Chicago says, I wish we had 
an attorney general that was Latino. We're, just, we're they're just trying to get to the table. But in California, Latinos run California. Our mayor in Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, the speaker of the assembly, Anthony Rendon, down from LA, went to UC Riverside, Latino. Former president of the state of California, Kevin De Leon, an immigrant from Mexico, from Tijuana to San Diego, went to UCLA. These individuals, people like you, run California. So if you're gonna, whatever you're gonna do, whether you're gonna own your own business, or whether you're gonna be in corporate America, know who the policy makers are that are gonna impact your business or your industry. Uh, so that's the power of, uh, of network. How much time do I got? I've got 30 minutes. I want some Q&A, so I'm gonna give you two other things. They talked about progress, but there was some financial progress. Is that one of the things that you've been talking about? Okay, in addition to a college degree, the other most important thing you're going to need to have and know is a good FICO score. How many people know what a FICO score is? That is your, Miguel, you know it's selling homes. A FICO score will determine is your financial ability, it will impact the rest of your life. Your ability to buy a car, your ability to buy a home, your ability to start a business, and now, in today's day and age, when you apply for a job, a lot of companies look at your FICO score to determine your ability to be responsive. So learn the importance of a FICO score. And if you, ladies, if you deal, if you do hook up with a guy who has a FICO score, drop him. <laughs> don't, don't hook up with anybody who has a bad FICO score, because that's going to bring you down. So when you guys do your dating app, say, what's your FICO score? <laughs> I'm serious. You think I'm kidding. I'm very serious. But, but FICO scores are perfect and important. I know you guys are going to learn a lot of things about financial progress and financial empowerment. If you don't know what a FICO score, don't be ashamed. Go ahead, Google it, learn it. It's going to be a key to your future. Professionally and personally. Uh, and then I think you guys are already learning about the taxes uh, that are going on right now. As business majors or as people that want to get into business, you're going to have to understand the financial implications that are going to impact you. If you're going to start a, a restaurant, anybody want to own a, re own a business? Okay, what are you, you're, wait a minute, you're from Bitcoin. I'm, I just I just Google I just texted Alex that he didn't know me what he was. <laughs> he said he's gonna call your mom. <laughs> um, what kind of business do you want to have? Um, like I really need jobs, and so like maybe like starting a business on the road, like on the job, and sell them all over the country. Okay, good. So then you're gonna have to understand the businesses, the the the, the policies, and the taxes that. If, that impact your business, right? There's a lot of certification. You know, I don't know if that business is certified. So you're gonna have to, because that will have an impact on your business. Or, or a nonprofit, Nelly. Okay, or not. <laughs> but if, you, if you're gonna have employees, which I'm assuming you're not gonna do everything by yourself, you're gonna have to understand workers' comp, you're gonna have to understand uh, labor laws, you're going to have to understand scheduling laws that are now being proposed. Okay, here you go. Score. Talk to Miguel and score. Business tax changes, personnel changes. All these issues are important in your career, professionally and personally. And I know for a lot of us, uh, you know, it's an uncomfortable question to ask about What's my 401k look like? What's my deferred comp look like? But you gotta ask those questions or you're gonna miss opportunities and make bad mistakes. So please work with Miguel and score because I can't emphasize enough wearing my banker hat, the importance of understanding financial issues. 
Okay, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to touch on the last thing, I think. Change. Understanding change and diversity in the workforce. Ooh. I have, I, I probably believe the, the king of dealing with change. In the banking industry, when I was in banking, when I started, I think there was 25 major banks. This was 1995. There were 25 major banks. Now there's four major banks. Uh, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Citibank, and Wells Fargo. That's it. Before, there was about 25 to 30, maybe even more. So in my career, it was just the nonstop mergers and acquisitions when banks would merge with themselves. I had to navigate through that. Uh, the only way to deal with that is embrace it. Put a, put a seatbelt on and, and deal with it and learn the new culture of the bank <laughs> that is going to be on the, on the, on the, on the building. Not the one that got bought, but the one that was doing the buying. Uh, sometimes I work with some employees and they say, well, this is how we used to do it. Well, that, you're, you're, how you used to do it, that bank didn't survive. We need, you need to figure out how you're going to comply with the strategies of the bank who's doing it, who's on the building. Uh, another, another one, I'm going to say this uh, to, my, to my fellas. The, one of the biggest changes that I think is terrific and exciting is the change in women leadership in key roles. The growth of women in key roles as executives or as supervisors or as CEOs has, has grown tremendously in my career. This is terrific. The guys that didn't understand that, no longer here. Fellas, these are your equals. These are your, they are your peers. Learn from them. All of my, I think three or four of my, uh, maybe, maybe even more, were women. The best thing I did was learn from them. They were terrific, uh, excellent supervisors, but it's important that this generation supports them. I can't, I can't express that enough. Um, and I think it's hard because in our culture, when Miguel and I were, were kids a long, long time ago, that wasn't the case. Our culture was, you know, girls don't go to school. Girls stay home, right? That's different. You guys are trailblazers. You ladies are trailblazers. You guys are breaking centuries of a culture that we've had to live by. And I applaud you for that. And you should continue to be a trailblazer. I don't want my daughter to be a trailblazer. I want her to be independent. I want her to be empowered. I don't want her to have to rely on somebody. I want her to be the supervisor. So continue to do that. And fellas, you got, you got challenges now. The only way that you're gonna be able to to, to get in that position if you're competing for be a supervisor, just to be better, skill-wise. So that should, that, you guys should accept that challenge and work together and be supportive of, of the women who are becoming more and more influential in, uh, in corporate America, especially. And let me touch on, because I've got 20 minutes. Let me touch on today's situation with this Me Too movement. You guys are very familiar with it. We, my gender, has lost the art, I think, I'm, I'm concerned about it, of being a gentleman. We need to go back and teach our young men how to be gentlemen and how to be respectful and how to be equal in our interaction. And I think that it's important that for all, for this generation to be successful, we got to address that and we got to fix it. And women, if you come across an uncomfortable situation, call it out and do not accept it. Forthwith, that means immediately, for folks who are in legal, immediately call it out. Guys, don't accept it. Be there. It's important to 
the future of this generation. Your generation is a groundbreaking generation, and I'm excited about the future that you guys are gonna provide because when I'm retired, I'm gonna have to look to you to keep making the money. My daughter's gonna have to take care of me. And I want her to be I want her to be rich so I, you know I'm chilling <laughs> on the porch. Uh, we have any questions? You guys have any questions so far? No questions? Because I'll go to every table and ask a question. <laughs> any questions? Okay. Oh, you got a question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just I don't know, man. Like you go do stuff every day. What, what's that going to be? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think I got ADD because that's why I love my job. My uh, every day, nonstop. You can ask them every day. Today, tomorrow, I have a board meeting tomorrow on Sunday with an organization that I'm the vice chair of. I could wake up and it could be uh, a soda tax in Chicago. So Chicago wants to pass a soda tax because Chicago has fiscal challenges. They don't have enough money to pay for the city services because the Illinois state hasn't passed the budget. So because the state of Illinois hasn't passed the budget, Chicago doesn't get money for the firemen, for the schools, for the streets. So Mayor Emanuel from Chicago goes to the aldermen of, of the city council. Okay, guys, we need to generate some revenue, come up with some ideas. This person, this alderman says, all right, let's pass a soda tax. Let's, let's create a soda tax. So when you buy a soda, we're gonna add a two cent tax. That'll generate money for the city. I gotta stop that. I gotta educate the alderman on how that's not beneficial. Uh, I don't just say it. I don't say, hey, stop it, it's no good. I say, it's gonna impact that small business owner, the person that owns that bodega, the person that owns that restaurant, that's already struggling, struggling. That we can pay taxes, but that tax is gonna impact that small business owner who has the restaurant, who's working every day to try to provide a good food product to get generate traffic, has to pay for the employees. That's what you're gonna hurt or hurt. That's an example. I could uh, say Coca-Cola wants to get the new Diet Coke app. We just launched Diet Coke after 30 years to reach millennials. I will work with our marketing department to say, look, the millennials uh, in Santa Barbara are different from the millennials in Denver, and this is our strategy to connect with, uh, with the millennials in that product. Uh, I have to make sure that we are promoting not just the classic Coke, but beverages for life. So when you wake up every day, you're drinking something, right? I have to say, well, with Minute Maid orange juice, or the coffee, water throughout, maybe soda throughout the day. We got iced tea, so I have to promote that throughout the, throughout the day. Um, could be work or it could be DACA. I am very proud that my company signed on with other CEOs on a letter to Congress and the Trump administration to say we need to pass DACA. Quit messing around, quit kicking the rock down the table, pass DACA, Coca-Cola wants that passed. If I'm not at the table, thank you very much, but if I'm not at the table of the executive leadership team that I mentioned earlier, where I'm one of 13, and I don't mention that, Maybe it's not even considered. I have to fight for that. Do I risk myself uh, when I be a voice on the importance of that? Yeah, but is that what I'm paid to do? Yeah. So we signed on uh, urging Congress to pass DACA. So those are just three things. I mean, you can ask Washington Dice all day, nonstop. We drove from San Diego yesterday, Santa Barbara, Five hour drive. Uh, stop at Big Sal's in Encino, by the way. Good burger spot <laughs> here in Encino. I was probably on the phone for four of those hours talking about a range of issues. Congressional members, <clears throat> city council members. So my day is very, very diverse. But that fits me. I can't be Monday through Friday behind a desk nine to five. I, I'm not wired that way. As you can tell, I'm kind of all over the place. Yeah, walking around. Yeah, walking around. In the back. 
Yeah, I just want to ask, how do you create a work-life balance when your your job great question. demands so much from you? Great question. You don't. <laughs> you blend it. My wife and daughter are here. I made a commitment to Miguel. Miguel asked me a long time ago, can I come up to Santa Barbara to talk to some wonderful kids? I gave my word. Didn't work on the, the work day, didn't work out. We found today. I said, look, I can't continue to be away from you. You guys are going to have to get on the road. I have national responsibilities. I'm all over. You guys are going to have to go with me. And so today's a good example. I brought him with me. It's probably the biggest challenge I have in my career is the work-life balance. Because I think in today's environment with technology, you're always on, you know, with email, with the phone, with the texting. Uh, I don't have Twitter, I don't have social media. Uh, I think I'm on LinkedIn, that's the only thing. But I don't have a Facebook, I don't have Instagram. Because that is my only, I think is the only way I can kind of disconnect. But other than that, it's nonstop. And I think the biggest thing uh, in my promotion and my new role, this is a whole new level. And it is nonstop. If the president or CEO of Coca-Cola wants something, it has to be done that day. Uh, so I'm just working hard to try to blend it. I invite them with me when I travel. Uh, and include them, but uh, really there is no work-life balance. I'm sure if I gave them the mic, they'd have something else to say. <laughs> but it, it, that's going to be one of your biggest challenges. And whatever you do, whether you get into the corporate America or whether you start your own business, if you start your own business, that's nonstop too. Um, but that's a good question. Both are good questions. Anything else? Peter, can you tell everybody why you didn't work last weekend? <laughs> where, where were you last weekend? <laughs> um, where was I? Well, the Super Bowl was on. <laughs> um, you guys don't want to get together on the Super Bowl, do you? No. Oh, it's Sunday. Oh, Sunday, yeah, well. <laughs> work life. <laughs> uh, any other questions? <laughs> Thanks for throwing me underneath the bus, Miguel. Uh, yes? Well, talking about marketing, how, how this brand manage the way of thinking of many people from different uh, culture places? Like, <laughs> I know it's a thing, but at the same time, at the same time you know, uh, Latin, Latin culture. Yeah. Even if we came from the same background, we like different things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we love family things, which is one of our more uh, culture things that we have. Yeah. But like in other countries like uh, uh, Costa Rica, like uh, the Dominican uh, Republic, Puerto Rico, they don't see, uh, well, they think differently. And this brand actually uh, think all the countries together, so how? And that means to me a lot. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know, you can't imagine um, how you can do all of that to one up. Yeah, that's a good question. We, uh, although we are global, we are very local. Um, so this product is made here in uh, California. And when you drink it in Chile, the product is made in Chile. When you drink it in uh, Costa Rica, it's made in Costa Rica. I think this was actually made, uh, uh, Downey, California. Anybody from Downey? Oh, Downey, look at Ray, Ray's roof. Yeah, that's our biggest manufacturing plant. So the reason why our product tastes so good is because it's made locally. The only thing that comes in is our Coca-Cola uh, Coca from Mexico. Because that's made with uh, sugar cane. Yeah. Uh, and then we import that. But like how like we make the product, our marketing is local too. So if you go to uh, Bolivia or if you go to uh, 
uh, El Salvador, or you go to uh, Jalisco, though the marketing for those products are local, so that they connect with the local communities. Because we can't run a product, uh, you know, we do a commercial with mariachis and we go to Cuba, they don't like what, what? So mariachi. Uh, so our marketing is local, our, our products are local, but we're local. Any other questions? Oh, okay, yes. Is there a reason why Coca-Cola is not allowing Cuba and Hannah? Um, yes, because uh, um, some of the social issues that are happening. And there's other social issues across the country, across the world, but those were, at the time, we were, we didn't want to comply with the leadership of those countries. Back then it was uh, Fidel Castro, and then when uh, the Iranian uh, revolution took over and uh, Khomeini came in, they kicked us out. Um, so we take into consideration a lot of these big issues that are impacting humanity across the world. In Africa, we're very, we're very uh, aggressive on trying to address water issues, uh, and we're also very aggressive in, in trying to address other social issues. We understand that we have a big responsibility in making sure that society is a better place for us. And I think as business majors, as people who are interested in business, the power of business is much more powerful, in my view, than and sometimes even political or community. When a business speaks, it can change many, many things for the positive. Um, so is so sports, so can sports. Uh, so that's why. Any last questions? How am I doing on time, Maria? Ten you got 10 minutes? minutes? Ten. You got me for 10 minutes, folks. You might as well use me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to give you my last uh, thoughts. And you guys can address this. I'll just say these are the things that helped me. By the way, I'm not done, right? I'm 50, but I ain't done. I still got ways to go. I still have goals, uh, which is one of the reasons why I moved to Coca-Cola because I still have ambition. Um, but I would say the, the couple things that uh, I think is helping. Don't be a hater. Do not hate on people who may be successful or who may achieve something that maybe you wish you would have got that job or you would have got that position. Um, being a hater is negative. And that's just, it's the sooner that you can be positive and be supportive of friends, of people, I think the better off you're going to be professionally and personally. So don't hate. Uh, earn your stripes. I started as a teller. I don't have a degree. If there's one person that's earned their stripes to where I am today, it's me. I know a lot of people that get their college degrees and say, I want to be vice president of this and I want that role. Well, you got to earn your stripes. And uh, if, if they didn't get that position, then they didn't even want to enter the workforce. They didn't even want the jobs. So you got to get your foot in the door so you can showcase your skills. Just because you got a college degree, you're all going to get college degrees, and I applaud you for it. The other people that are going to be applying for the job you want to get have college degrees. It's going to be very competitive. And the only way that you're going to separate yourself is your own individual uniqueness. What do you bring to the table that's different than who you're going to be competing with for a job? And that is your own personality. And that's how one of the ways you got to earn your stripes for whatever it is you want to achieve. Um, like Miguel and like the people at SCORE, whatever you do, 
the best that you're truly not successful unless you help others succeed. A man stands as tall as when he kneels down to help someone else. Help people. This is a way for me to, to help and do a small part in trying to help people succeed, you succeed. If what I've said today is helpful and maybe you get one thing out of it, then I've done my job. And I think it's important when you do your game plan and your business plan, make sure you put a slot for helping others, help others succeed. If you go back to the corner and you say, oh yeah, I know who Alex Padilla is, I've helped you, <laughs> right? I feel good. I'm gonna tell Alex about you. I feel good about that. But you should feel good, you should try to help others when you can. Uh, well, I already said bounce negative people from your life, right? I told you guys, get rid of the knuckleheads, right? <laughs> Be stubborn. I wouldn't be here if, if you just put it on paper, Peter Villegas, no college degree, no background, I wouldn't be here. My stubbornness, my commitment, or stubbornness to not letting other people dictate my future is why I'm here. So you can either say, Commitment or be stubborn. I like be stubborn because it's, it's a little bit funner say that, than, than commitment. Uh, get out of your comfort zone. Love that you're working together. You're helping each other. You're going through your journey. You've got to rely on one another. But I would recommend, and I hope that you guys are meeting the Asian Business Association and the African American Business Association and the Gay and Lesbian Business Association. If there's one thing I would add to learn onto learning your public policy makers, I would I would initiate a multi-organization gathering so that you can meet people from outside your comfort zone. It's one of the best things you can do for your career. And then finally, what's my last thing? Oh, I if you're gonna wrap me up, if you're gonna if I was going to say one thing about why I'm here, I have a blue collar mentality and a white collar profession. I'm like my dad. I'm the, I'm the driller on top of the mountain. I just try to outwork people. I can learn things all the time. You're always learning. You're always reading. Education is a marathon. Just because you get the degree doesn't mean you stop learning. I've learned how to underwrite multi-family models. I've learned how to the finances. I learned how to, uh, to articulate our position on derivatives and on the, the impact on the, on the stock market on oil prices in in the Middle East. I'm learning what uh, you know what the Coke products do in terms of water and the ingredients in it. So you're always learning, uh, and you've got the degree, but you got to hustle. You got to continue hustling. Uh, to be successful. Uh, I hope that I was helpful. I hope it was somewhat valuable to you, and I, I enjoyed it. Thank you for uh, letting me come and speak to you. If, if there's no final questions, I want to apply. Oh, wait, uh, one more. <laughs> yes. Um, so you have to so you, Coca Cola is not just Coke. You have like water products, and you have tea, and you have a lot of other probably over 500. Um, Products. Yeah, so do you um, market different products based on the demographics? So if you have a community that's impoverished that can't afford like fresh water, do you market like the water and tea versus the actual Coca-Cola? Because I know you recently made an ad about like clean water. Yeah, um, it's a good question. Yeah. First of all, the difference between banking and Coca-Cola is in banking, uh, every, every, you market towards the income. Right, so if I'm trying, if I'm in banking, and, or if you're in banking, or I'm in banking, you know, we target, if you're gonna buy a house, you're gonna to talk to the, to the real estate department. If you're gonna start a business, you're gonna to start to the, to the business department, a small business lending department. If you're rich, you're gonna to talk to the private wealth management. If you're moderate income, you go to the retail. So banking is focused on income. 
Coca-Cola, it, it doesn't matter. I could be the janitor at Tijuana University or President of the United States. It's the same. And the way we market is uh, to, to a product that I think touches that lifestyle. I'll give you three examples. Number, number one, we, our top, our, our top uh, target is women. Women make the decisions whether they're single or, or they're making the purchases for a family. You guys are gonna determine what your family or you wanna put in your body. So women are our top uh, mark. Uh, millennials are followed closely because you guys are very thoughtful in the products that you put in your body. You're much more healthier than the Gallus generation. <laughs> Uh, so we want to target women and millennials. And we do that uh, through a product that we think touches them. Sprite, Sprite is our, uh, is our teen product. Sprite touches teens the best, predominantly African Americans through music, through hip hop. We think that Sprite can also touch Latinos through the bridge of music. Um, so we're really going to try to push Sprite towards Latinos, where it's predominantly the African Americans. This new Diet Coke uh, that's coming out, we want millennials to consider Diet Coke because it's been 30 years since we've you know, done any change to the market and really has hung on to the older generation. We want to retarget for millennials. But I was saying if that community is like has a high obesity rate, would you still market? Sure, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a responsibility of the consumer. Everything that is in this product is on this can. It's a responsibility of the consumer to know what's in the product. We, it's our responsibility to tell them. If you don't want to drink Coca-Cola because you're concerned about health or obesity, don't drink, you can drink our water. <laughs> or you can drink our orange juice. Our responsibility is to make sure that it's factual, that you can read it, that you can see it. So this is 140 calories in this product. And we do it in English and Spanish in the stores. We want a healthier community. And this transparency is a way to do that. And also, if you saw some of the smaller cans, you know, the real small ones, the mini cans, we've heard the consumers. We don't want the big uh, leaders that Miguel used to drink, <laughs> right? The big, the big plastic leaders. We want smaller portions. So we understand that, we've heard the consumer, so now we sell the smaller mini cans. So if you don't want to drink this can, you can drink the smaller can. But our responsibility is to make sure that the facts are here, that everybody knows what they're putting on the, in their body, and we do that with every single product. Now, if you don't want to drink it, perfectly fine. Um, then you can drink some of our other products. Does that does that help? Does that we're sensitive about it? We're very thoughtful about it, and we want to continue the dialogue about it. And we hope that you guys continue to offer your opinions on our products. So, you know, the louder that you are in terms of how concerned you are about health or obesity, let us know. I think the biggest, you know, <laughs> I, I when I first got here, I didn't do any media training, and I was in a similar situation, and someone said something about, you know, Coke's factory, so I said, just don't drink it. You know, that's okay. You don't have to drink Coke. We're not forcing you. Uh, but it was funny, because the guy was drinking a beer at the same time. <laughs> he was telling me. I thought that was a little odd. But uh, we want to be transparent with our products. We want healthier products. And we want to make sure that it touches the needs of the consumer. And that we, we promote that it's not just the Coke, classic Coke, but we have Fairlife Milk, we have orange juice. We have a portfolio of, of, of products that you can enjoy if you want, for any reason. Powerade, if you're working out. Uh, Fairlife, if you, if you want to have some milk. Core Power. Core Power, see? Got my family trained. By the way, I get, <laughs> when we go to restaurants, they're not allowed to drink anything else besides. <laughs> so, I hope that answers your question.
But I think you guys have been terrific. Any other questions? Well, Kwame, you got anything back there? No. no. <laughs> Uh, okay, sir. Sorry. But what's the difference between the, the new Diet Coke and the old one? Is it is it lawsuit related? Is, is that a thing or no? No. Oh. Against, against Coke? No. Lawsuit? I was, I was, I was, I've heard something about like, potential lawsuit against Coke because uh, a Diet Diet Coke and just Diet Soda the way it's like all the advertising. You you know you hear so many things. I've heard so many things like. Uh, co-created Santa Claus. <laughs> kind of did. Um, no, it, our, our, our Diet Coke has become stale. The, 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 the sales have been stale. That We connected with the generation, Miguel's generation, and as it got older, the younger generation wanted to be hipper. Uh, uh, we didn't connect with the younger generation. So our whole Diet Coke, same, same product, but the marketing is gonna be aimed at you guys. Slimmer cans, smaller presentation. Uh, I think if you saw the ad during the Super Bowl, you saw our, our uh, Diet Coke ad. So you're gonna be seeing more of that. But no, it's just, we, we gotta improve the sales. And the only way to improve the sales is to connect with this generation. You guys are in the driver's seat. I can't say enough. Not just for Coca-Cola, but any industry <coughs> and any company. You guys, this generation, and Latinos are the number one consumer target for anybody. Whether you want to drive a car, whether you want to get a phone, whatever you want to do. And you guys should use that power thoughtfully. Okay, I think I'm getting pulled. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I hope you thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miguel, thank you very much.